Well, as I said earlier, I have the same feeling today that I had a lot of years ago when we actually started church. In fact, coming up in two weeks is our 12-year anniversary of being here uh, in this building. Um, so that's coming up rather quick. But I had a horrible, horrible dream last night. Uh, I woke up this morning and I told Monica about it. And she just sort of laughed at me like how ignorant or whatever. But, um, and so luckily what I dreamed about hasn't happened because uh, I have my notes, I have my Bible, um, sort of good to go there. Um, it is good for us to look out and see faces. Um, for the last 11 weeks, uh, I've had the band lead me in private worship on Wednesday evenings. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then I've had to preach to Cole for the last 11 weeks. Uh, and, uh, he's not getting any better, so I don't know if he's not listening or, or what, but, uh, for the last 11 weeks on Thursdays, uh, I've been preaching to, preaching to Cole and, uh, trying to get through to him, but we have seen 2020 sort of start off the year with the best economic numbers, employment numbers, and investment numbers that we have ever seen in the life of our country, not just in the last few years of our country, but in the life of our country. But for the first time in my lifetime of 52 years, we have experienced something, the first thing I know of ever, that kept people from going to church or even, in fact, had to have the church close its doors. Now, some of you in here are a little bit older, maybe you remember maybe other things, but I know that we have gone through wars. We have gone through protests, we have gone through terrorist attacks, we have gone through viruses and diseases and outbreaks, and never has the church shut its doors. I mean, when, when we've gone through wars, I mean, it's daddies and mamas and brothers and sisters and husbands and wives that, that have ran to the church to pray for the safe return of their loved one. When we've experienced protest of any kind, regardless of the topic, we have seen people run to the church to pray for peace and to pray um, for the protest and, and, and those kinds of things. As we've uh, endured uh, terrorist attacks, both international like 9-11 and domestic terrorism like Oklahoma City, people flooded the churches, people ran to the churches to pray for peace and to pray for safety and for families and, yes, even to pray for justice. All sorts of diseases and illnesses have come along in, in our long history of our country, and yet never did the church shut down. And the reality is COVID is not our first virus, and it's not our worst virus. And people would run to the churches to pray for healing or protection or care. And it's sort of sad that these last 11 weeks, and I'm not even sure if, if that really registers with many of us, that it's really been almost three months since we've been here, but that the, it's sad that our doors have been shut, but it's really awesome that our hearts have remained open. Our hearts have remained open to God. Our hearts have remained open to each other. And I'm sure I will never hear all the stories of what has happened in the last 11 or 12 weeks, of where maybe God told you to do something, or God told you to go help somebody, or God told you to go get the groceries for this person, and you obeyed what God had asked you to do and went and done it. I have to give a huge shout out to our elders. Um, most of them were in the first service, but I have to give a huge shout out to our elders who for the last 11 or 12 weeks, uh, I know that I'm sure that when Dennis and Dan signed up, uh, they really didn't realize they were going to have to do all of this uh, that they've had to do in the last 11 or 12 weeks, but they have done daily devotionals. They have uh, called families in our churches each week just to stay connected with them. And so they've done a great, great job in that. And it isn't like we've ever gone through this before, so we didn't have a blueprint or any of the answers ahead of time. And I have to give a shout out to Cole Duke uh, because for the last 11 or 12 weeks, uh, he really has been the MVP of getting the services online so that you could watch them at home. Uh, and it's really, God is just so smart because it was months ago when we actually brought Cole on. And when we brought Cole on, he didn't even know how to run the software that he is now using to do all of that. And one of the things we got him doing was learning that and and, and, and talking to some folks on how to do that. And then yet, the last 11 or 12 weeks, it had not been for Cole, we wouldn't have had anything to put online for us to stay connected. 
So he's done a great, great job with that. We've been doing a series on the parables of Jesus, and I really felt like as we were coming back together today that God did not want me to sort of just continue in that. So we're just going to take a break uh, from that series just for today because I felt like God wanted me to say some things to us as we begin to regather again as a church body, as a church fellowship. Now, I didn't know exactly what that was. Um, and God, you know, I, a lot of pastors wait till Saturday night to do their message for Sunday, and, and, and I'm just not that way. That just would drive me insane. And so I usually I have a series, I sort of know where we're going, but on Mondays I usually start planning my sermon for the week. And I told God, God, I'll say whatever you want me to say, but please, please don't wait till Saturday night to tell me what that is. And so Monday I, I, I waited and nothing. Tuesday I waited Nothing. Wednesday I waited, went to lunch, nothing. And late Wednesday afternoon, God began to show me what I feel like He wants me to share today. And this is just a standalone message, it's just by itself. And you're probably going to say He seems sort of scatterbrained, and maybe you're right. But I really feel like this is what God wants me to share today as the church begins to gather back together as the fellowship of believers. So let me just start here in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. He has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. Now why has God not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. Well, Philippians chapter 1 sort of answers that question, for, that question for us. In verse 21, Paul says, For me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between the two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be better for me, but for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. You've heard me say many times that for the believer, for the follower, for the Christian, the, the worst that you experience on this earth is the worst that you will ever experience. And, and the best that you will ever experience in your life will not be experienced on this earth. But for the unbeliever, for the non-Christian... You need to know that the best that you experience on this earth is the best that you will ever experience in your life. And the worst that you will ever experience is waiting beyond. But God did not give us a spirit of fear and timidity. What did He give us? He gave us a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of self-control or self-discipline. I want you to write this down. If God wants to give it to you, Satan wants to snatch it from you. If God wants to give it to you, Satan wants to take it from you. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. You need to know that Satan is never on your side. He is never out for your best interest. He is not going to help guide you to better days. You may say, well, Rick, but this feels so good. Rick, this feels so right. Rick, you just don't know what I'm experiencing right now. And the reality is Satan may be leading you down the road, but you need to know that that road ends in destruction. His goal is to devour. His goal is never to build you up. His goal is never to encourage you. His goal is always to devour you. Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy. So if God wants to give us a spirit of power, Satan wants to take that away. If God wants to give us a spirit of love, Satan wants to take that away. If he wants to give us a spirit of self-discipline and self-control, Satan wants to take that away. He wants to take away our spirit of power. He tries to take away the power of God in our country. It started years ago and years ago when, when they began to say, well, let's just, let's, just, uh, let's just water down this a little bit. Let's just, we'll, we'll approve this law and it won't be that bad. 
The, it happened in our schools when they said, well, we'll just, we'll just stop prayer. And so now every day you're allowed to have a moment of silence to reflect on the activities of the day. It's just a way to try to snatch the power of God out of our schools and out of our country. Trying to snatch the power of God out of our families. And so today we're busier than ever before. Today we have access through, through internet and social media to, to more people than we've ever known before. We're connected with people we went to high school with and college with. And yet all the while trying to just steal, kill, and destroy the power of God in our families. The power of authority in our home. Today, children don't have a problem with mouthing off to mom and dad and standing up to mom and dad and screaming at mom and dad. Ask any teacher, they will tell you that every year the classes get worse. Why? Because he's just trying to take the power of authority out of the home, the power of authority out of the school, the power of authority out of the church and out of the community. He's trying to take away the power of the gospel of salvation. But the good news today is the scriptures tell us that the gates of hell will not prevail against him. He's trying to take the power of love, the power of life, of liberty, and the the pursuit of happiness. He's trying to steal, kill, and destroy that spirit of power that God's tried to give to us. He's trying to steal, kill, and destroy the, the power of love that God's given to us. A love for God, a love for His Word, a love for His church or His bride as He calls it in the Scriptures. A a love for His messages, a love for the gospel, a love for what God wants to do in our lives and in our families and in our communities. He's trying to take away the, the, the spirit of love for our family. So today we stay busier than ever before. We run around like chickens with our heads cut off. We, we just involved in this activity and that activity and this activity and that activity. And sometimes children wake up and their parents are already gone and children go to bed and their parents aren't home. For the spirit of love for community. Obviously we've seen that. What you're witnessing in our streets is nothing more than Satan trying to devour a spirit of love that God wants to give to our community. All races, all colors, all nationalities, all peoples everywhere. And the last one is he's trying to snatch away the love of yourself. I don't know if you realize this today, but we have more self-image diseases than ever before. Today more than ever, people wake up and they look in the mirror and they hear, you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not skinny enough, you're not tall enough, you're not smart enough, you can't do that, you can't make that happen. And it's all because Satan is trying to steal the love of the creation that God has created in you. And the love of self-control, of self-discipline. You've heard the acronyms FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. So yeah, just go do what you want to do, man, because you don't want to miss out. You've heard you YOLO, you only live once, right? Yeah, just go, man, you only live once, do it, man. Don't worry about what God says or what His Word says or what His Spirit says or what salvation says. Don't worry about any of this. You only live once, man. Go for it. Get it now, man. Hey, I can't afford it. Don't worry about it. Swipe it. I can't pay for it. Don't worry about it. Just duck the bill collars. I can't duck it. Well, then you just end up selling what you bought to begin with. You say, all right, Rick, well, you said today you want to spend some time praising the Lord. That doesn't sound like a lot of praise. I'm just trying to recap the last three months. And as we begin to gather together, God brought me to one verse. One verse that I do want to use today to praise our God for. Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. In verse 5, now let me just give you background before I, before I read that verse. The Israelites, we know, have wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses has just passed away. He has just died. And Joshua has been appointed and anointed as the leader of Israel. Now let me tell you why that is very important. Because when Moses died, Joshua said, you are now the leader of Israel. He was appointed. He was given the position of as the leader of Israel, but he was also anointed, which means he was given the power of the leader of Israel. 
So Joshua was anointed. He was appointed as the leader of Israel. They've waited to go into the promised land. And, and the Lord has told Joshua, get ready because tomorrow you're going in. And here is what Joshua tells the people. Verse 5 says, Then Joshua told the people, Purify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. Purify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. There are three things out of this one verse that I want to say to us today as we begin to gather together back as the church. The first one is this, purify yourself. Purify yourself. Today, my encouragement for you is to purify yourself. And luckily for us today, we don't have to have a lamb or a goat or a dove. We don't have to go to some altar and sacrifice. We don't have to have some formal ceremony. Because Jesus Christ has made it possible through his death on the cross for us to be purified through his blood. He died on the cross so that all of our sins might be forgiven, so that all of us might be found righteous. In, 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 in the Bible it says, confess your sins to him and he is faithful and just to forgive you. And that's how we purify ourselves. I don't know what this last three months has been like for you. I don't know, maybe it's advanced your, your spiritual journey. Maybe it's really, you know, you're further today than you were three months ago. You've experienced some things through God that, that is just really incredible. But maybe, just maybe, you've regressed a little bit. Maybe you've sort of fallen into some bad habits. Maybe you've sort of slipped away. Maybe it's, you spent all this three months in anxiety and worry rather than reliance on God. Whatever it might be, my encouragement to you is today... To purify yourself. Purify yourself through Christ. The second thing he says there is for tomorrow. For tomorrow. Regardless of what has happened today, there's tomorrow. Regardless of what, what, have you, what you have to face today, there is tomorrow. Even if today looks very bleak, there is tomorrow. A tomorrow. There is nothing that you and I have experienced that has not already been experienced in the past. And as dark as many of those days seem, there was always a tomorrow. In the middle of a great depression, there was tomorrow. In the middle of a war, there was tomorrow. In the middle of a, a, a crash, stock market crash, there was tomorrow. In the middle of Ebola and SARS and all of those things, there was Tomorrow and today, these last three months, whatever you've experienced, there is tomorrow. And guess what? Eventually, tomorrow is today. So purify yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do great wonders among you. The Lord will do great wonders among you. Some of our brightest days have come after our darkest nights. I mean, just remember the rainbow happened after the flood. Easter Sunday resurrection came after the Friday crucifixion. The Holy Spirit fire came down from heaven after Spirit, after Jesus ascended back into heaven. The gospel spread more than it ever had when? After the Christians had been persecuted. And ever since then and even till today, some of our brightest days come after our darkest nights. There's a story of a missionary, and I don't really remember their, their name right now, but they spent years of toil and trouble uh, of just trying to, to get into this tribe in Africa. And him and his wife and kids, and they were all there, and, and they just tried for years and years and years. To penetrate this tribe with, with the gospel. To get the good news to, to the tribal leaders. To, to, and they did all sorts of things. To, to offer goodwill. To, to let them know they weren't a danger. They just did all sorts of things for years after years after years after years and nothing. One day the missionary died. And lo and behold, if that tribe did not open up. Like, like a dam opening up and the water busting through. Because after all of those years of all of that, those, those people in that, in that tribe had watched 
that missionary. They had watched his life. They had watched him be nice, and they spit on him. They had watched him offer them things, food, and all sorts of stuff, and then reject it. They had watched all of that, and they'd watched him be faithful. And when he died, the, the gates just opened up, and the gospel spread through that tribe and through that area like never before. The Lord wants to do great wonders through you. I believe that God wants to take each of us individually to places and to heights, uh, to, to places that we've never imagined in our spiritual journey. And if God will do that to each of us personally, I believe collectively as a church, we will see God do things that we could have never imagined possible. The Lord wants to do great things <coughs> through us today. We have a simple mission. It isn't hard. You love the Lord your God with your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And the second part of it is, you love your neighbor as yourself. If we will do those two things, <coughs> if we will love the Lord our God, with our heart, our soul, and our mind. We will see God do incredible things. If we will love our neighbors as ourselves, we will see God do great wonders among you. So he told them, purify yourself for tomorrow. The Lord will do great wonders among you. If you go on to read the rest of chapter 3 and First part of chapter 4, you're going to find out that God did some incredible stuff in those days. God parted the waters back. They walked across on dry land. They actually got 12 stones, one each to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And they built memorials. Uh, they built one outside the water. They actually built a memorial inside the water, uh, inside the river where God had, where the ark had stopped, where they crossed. And, 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 and Joshua says to the people this in chapter 4, he said, he said, in the future, your children will ask, what do these stones mean? He says, then you can tell them, this is where the Israelites crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the river right before your eyes, and he kept it dry until you were all across, just as he did at the Red Sea. When he dried it up, until we had all crossed over. He did this so all the nations of the earth might know that the Lord's hand is powerful, and so you might fear the Lord your God forever. He did this so that the nations of the earth might know that the Lord's hand is powerful. So let me ask you, what are you going to tell your children and your grandchildren about these last three months? What are you going to tell your children and your grandchildren? See, I want to tell my children and grandchildren of how the Lord protected many more from getting sick of the virus. I want to tell my children and grandchildren how the Lord healed many of the people who actually caught the virus. I want to tell my children and grandchildren of how God sustained and undergirded the families of those who lost loved ones through this virus. I want to tell how the Lord sustained doctors and nurses and the police and the fire and rescue workers. How they worked 12 and 16 and 18 hour days and, and they worked 10, 12, 14 days in a row. But the Lord undergirded them and sustained them. I want to tell how God provided masks and ventilators and yes, even toilet paper during these days. I want to tell how God gave us peace in the middle of unrest when things were going crazy like any of us had never seen, God gave us peace. How he gave rest to the weary. How he shined light in the darkness. Now I want you to get this. How he took what was supposed to be a financial disaster in the month of May. And how he turned it into the best giving month of the year in the life of our church. Only God can do that. God wants to do great things, and he did. 
I want to tell of how lost people came to know Christ in these last months. I want, to, I want to be able to tell my children and grandchildren about vacation Bible school that was done in such an incredibly different way. And yet the seeds were planted and watered and harvested and people, kids came to know Christ. How Christians were undergirded, how the hurting were healed. The Bible says, I will sing of the Lord forever. For He has done great things. These last three months have been a time unlike any in most of our lives. And we have seen good and we have seen bad. We have seen faith built. We've seen it wane. We've seen Christians soar. We've seen some sputter. But the truth today is, the Lord wants to do great things in you. So purify yourself for tomorrow. The Lord will do great things. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for Joshua. And I thank you for Lord, His faithfulness, first of all, uh, to be Your servant that You appointed and anointed, Father, to lead the people into the promised land. Father, I thank You that He was part of that generation that saw You do incredible things. He was part of that generation that was able to tell His children and grandchildren about crossing the Jordan on dry ground. And Father, today we've gone through a dark period in, in our lives, and Father, in, in our lives of our country. Father, through this COVID virus and, and even through protest and rioting, Father, we've, we've just gone through a dark period. But I believe that there's tomorrow. And I believe that you want to do great things through each of us individually. So Father, help us today to purify ourselves, to prepare ourselves for the great work that you want to do. Help us to be the one that's willing to be the testimony of the voice of, of how you've done incredible things in our lives. And Father, help us today, tomorrow, in the midst of still all this madness, to be able to say, He has done great things. Father, I thank you for that today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and Tucker, and then we're going to lead us through one final song before we dismiss. And, and as he does, just contemplate that thought. Today, are you willing to and step out to purify yourself, to let God forgive you of your sins, to let God come and put His Spirit inside of you and change your life, to change your direction, to change everything about your future. And are you willing to say tomorrow, God's going to do some great things?